right, here we are. Addictively Speaking Podcast. My name is James. I'm your host. And my guest today is Sarah Ibrahim. And she is a single mom from Essex, two and a half years free from cocaine addiction. Well done. Congratulations Thank on that. You. She is a qualified, certified recovery coach. Um, her story has been featured on various media outlets and global media outlets across the world. Um, and her mission is to be the person saying the things that I wish someone had been saying when I needed to hear them. That's pretty powerful stuff right there. Yeah, it's the truth yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so for the listeners, why don't you give us a little brief, you know, description of you and who you are and what you're doing. So um, I don't know if brief is exactly my uh, strong point, but I'll give it a go, James. <laughs> So, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. This is so exciting. Like, we've been trying to organise this for a long time, haven't we? So, um, yes. I'm Sarah. <laughs> I am Sarah, and it is my joy to be here with you guys today. Um, as James said, you know, I'm a single mum. I'm in Essex here in the UK, and I gave away, like, 20 years of my life to addiction of one kind or another. And, like, the reality is it probably started when I was in my teens, if I'm really honest um although I wasn't what you would call an addict then you know I started drinking with my dad from an early age around 13 in the pub in my school uniform drinking and drinking and drinking and you know this was just normal for me and he was kind of cool if I'm real with you because it was like you know I had that cool dad that didn't mind me drinking and he didn't mind me smoking but I look back now and I'm just like wow what kind of parenting was that um and that's without animosity you know without judgment and but I also have to be real and go like, okay, I can see some of how I've ended up where I did. And so he unfortunately died when I was 17. And that kind of sent me spiraling, really. Um, mm. So I discovered ecstasy, first of all. And that was like the best thing in the whole freaking world. It was just like a place where I did not have to think. And I didn't have to worry. And I didn't have to you know, feel anything apart from all of the good stuff, right? And so 10 years went by, <laughs> 10 years went by of me absolutely pilling out of my face. And, you know, we would rave and party and I lost a fuck ton of jobs. I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of boyfriends, you know, all of the things. Um, but I didn't worry about it because I didn't have to feel anything. And it was awesome, right? And then, you know, cocaine came along. And this was really the demon that I gave my life away to. So the pills, I like to think I could have put down at some point. But the coke, no way. The coke had its claws into me. But what's interesting, James, I don't know what your own journey has been like. But what's interesting to me is that the the... The cocaine didn't get hold of me immediately, right? So it had been around me for about seven years. By the time it really became a problem for me, it had been around me for a long time. And I had, you know, it was never something that I really particularly wanted. It wasn't something that I would seek out. It wasn't something that I would pay for. Most definitely not. But I just kept meeting people that did it. And so being the party girl that I was, if it's the lines in front of me, well, I'm going to do that line. Um, and somehow, somewhere along that path, it it all switched around and it was no longer recreational. It was a had to have rather than a nice to have. And I remember very clearly, you know, at 27 being like, shit, I, <laughs> I, I actually, you know, this is running my life, recognizing that it was running my life, but not really recognizing that it was running my life to the point that, you know, hello, time to do something about it. And hey, presto, another 12 years went past. And in that time, you know, I got married, I got divorced, I lost another load more jobs, I worked a couple of seasons abroad, I got pregnant from a one night stand, you name it, I done it. Um, and you know, that was my life, basically. And it was actually the getting pregnant that was the catalyst to finally, finally start to change. So, you know, my story's been very, very public. And what happened was that I, I well, had this one I stand, <laughs> you know, and found out that I was pregnant. And I was just like, I went into complete meltdown, James. I was just like, no, I'm sorry, what, who? Uh, I, like, I can't even look after myself. You are mad. I am not having a baby. No freaking way. Well, I was 36 at the time. You know, I'd had a good long run of partying. I had done whatever I wanted for my whole adult life. You know, it had only been me, myself and I that I had to answer to. I had no responsibilities. I was living and working abroad. My money was mine and I just spent it on drugs. And that was all good with me. And then this tiny human was inside of me. And I was like, I can't, I'm not doing this. 
And so I went straight out on a three day bender, right? Because well, I wasn't going to have the baby anyway, right? And yeah. sobered up three days later. And I suddenly realized, like, I just had this moment of clarity where I was like, shit, this child has been sent to save your life. And I was like, wow, okay. Wow. Like, I choose, if I choose not to go ahead with this, that's basically equates to me choosing partying over a human life. And I'm, I'm not her. I'm not her. So I decided to keep him, right? And this was huge. <laughs> of right but from that moment and I was only I think maybe five weeks pregnant at that time from that moment you know I was so excited James because I was just like finally something to give my life meaning something to give my life purpose something to channel my energy and my my love into something I can love forever that's going to love me back you know no matter what I do no matter who I am and I saved up two grand can you imagine I had two grand when I was 36 years old the first time I've had more than like 20 quid to my name right (laughs) because I would just spend it all yeah worry about it I just wouldn't and you know he came along and I really thought that I would never go back like I I started going to church I gave up the booze the coke the fags in a heartbeat and it didn't trouble me at all and I just completely turned everything around and I was like wow this is awesome I'm gonna have such a good life now and then three months later of course the relapse because it was never really my choice and so here's what I've learned in recovery right about that particular piece is that until it's your choice you're not going to succeed right yeah it doesn't it doesn't stick does it It, because it's yeah you made the decision for somebody else or something else instead of for you exactly that and so to all intents and purposes it's, it's complex because it's like well I did decide to do that for me because I decided that I was having the baby right but the step before that is that I didn't choose to get pregnant, right? I didn't yeah. choose that. And so that's where it all came undone for me. And it took me about two years to realize that. But I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> now I see, right, the piece that was missing. And so I relapsed and, you know, then COVID happens and the whole world shut down. And it was a perfect storm for my addiction to just go completely freaking wild um, because I was shut away from the world. So no one knew how much I was using. No one mm. knew what I was doing. No one knew what I was up against. And I wouldn't tell anyone because, well, people might think I wanted to stop. And there is no way in on the earth that I wanted to stop. And, you know, and also I didn't want people worrying about me because I just thought it's just going to be another barrier to get through. People chew my ear off about it when I know that I'm still going to do it. So why am I going to put obstacles in my own way? I just want to get on with sniffing, basically. And Mm. that's what I did. And it was horrendous, (laughs) really. Um, And it took some time, but eventually I got there and, you know, decided that actually, do you know what? This is it now. I'm done. Like, I didn't have six pound, James, to buy my son a pair of pajamas. But I had just spent like 500 quid with my dealer in the last like five or 10 days prior to that. And I was just like, you're sick. You are sick. You don't deserve to have a child. You don't deserve to be a mum. You don't, you, you know, there's something wrong with you. And giving myself all of these messages and, and feeling so guilty. And then that being the thing that drove the behaviour again. Because, well, we don't yeah. think about that stuff, do we? <laughs> we, mm. we know how to treat, like, bad feeling. And if it doesn't feel good, well, we just fix it with a line or yeah. whatever oh, it is yeah. we just, do. Just, just numb it away. Just drink it away. Just smoke it away. Just just bury it. You exactly. Know, if, you, if, you, if you're too inebriated to feel anything, I mean, nothing yeah. is – there's no pain. It's just like make it stop. Make it stop. We know how to make it stop, right? But the thing is, yeah. well, what I've noticed is that it wasn't just bad stuff that I wanted to make it stop. It was good stuff as well. So it was like good day, Coke. Bad day, Coke. It's raining, Coke. I'm alive, Coke. You know, like every road led to cocaine and there was just no mm. getting away from it. And I truly believed that I was enjoying myself is the most bonkers thing of all. Um, like I really thought that I was choosing it. And it's only now that I can see that. It chose me because I was an easy victim, um, you know, and I was easily convinced that it was me. But so yeah. many of us are. Right. So I think we've 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 hit the what your drug of choice was. It was cocaine. That was the one that got you. But <laughs> you said it. so. Going back to what you earlier spoke on with your dad. Mm. So do you think? Yeah. Do you think it does it run in your family addiction at all, or is it? Do you think it's just, you know. Um, you started early, 
you got into this party phase, you started messing around with pills. Do you think it just was like one step led to the next step, led to the next step until you got to something that really hooked you? There's so many different components to this. So to answer your question Mm. directly, my dad was an alcoholic and he was a gambler. Um, But this didn't start until after I was born. So, you know, he hadn't been that person until until literally until I was born so my mum told me only recently actually that her her and my dad were friends with this couple that lived down the road who also had a baby at the exact same time and this neighbor he was a drinker his name was I can't remember what his name was now anyway whatever he was a drinker and so once I was born and their baby was born they off they went to the pub to wet the baby's head and he basically never came back was how the story goes you know she never Mm. had her husband back after that day uh, which yeah. is really freaking sad isn't it do you know what I mean but my dad was a Muslim you know he was an Egyptian living in this country and so you know for them drinking is not a thing you know and so he he hadn't been a drinker um wow. but there was some very interesting times when I was growing up so my dad was Muslim after I was born my mum went on this quest to discover the meaning of life and all of that stuff because I was going to ask her questions And so she set off on her merry way to, you know, test out everything and find the answers. So she was going to go to the church and the synagogue and the temple and whatever it was that she was going to do. Well, she went to the church and she never left, right? So now I've I've been born and both of them have changed in huge, massive ways and they're no longer the people that either of them married, right? Hmm. So right off the bat, (laughs) yeah, there's a very complex set of circumstances as well as the fact that he's Egyptian and she's English. So this culture thing and different religions just doesn't, you know, it it was tricky, but we say, right? Right. So he starts drinking. He's absent quite a lot of my childhood, right? And he's going off to Egypt and coming back. And he says he's going for two weeks and he turns up six months later, right? And so little Sarah starts to get this idea that, well, he doesn't love you. Like, you're not important mm. and you know i yeah. would be like you know when are you coming home i'm sure when you come back oh yeah i'm coming next week he wouldn't come back next week right and so after a while i started to realize this was a complete and total lie um and yet the lie remained and so that just reinforced it even more it was just like well, you're not even important enough to tell the truth to like you know who even are you yeah. and so there was that going on throughout my childhood like we later found out something else about one of these trips to egypt went into my teens my granddad died in between all this you know he was a very important person in my life he died when I was nine right and so that was a massive blow to me because he was like kind of like a father figure um and so the story goes that like you know all of the men in my life my dad my granddad they weren't there when I needed them yeah they they left me they abandoned me is where I'm going with this yeah and so you know by the time I was 18 or 17 my dad died and that was the ultimate abandonment I felt like he had abandoned abandoned me again and again and again throughout my my youth and then and then he died and so Sarah learned to treat herself in that way and I just abandoned myself time and time and time again I couldn't handle life without being out my nose. and so I created this whole identity this whole persona around you know being a life and soul and being this you know party girl and oh, I was very popular and all of that and it made me feel wanted it made me feel connected it made me feel you know more entertaining all of the things and I would do anything anything not to be alone with myself and I would just run I would run from me right and yeah. so I don't know if that really answers your question but that is the answer you know I I think yeah, yeah. I was just looking to fill a void when the void yeah. that I was trying to fill inside myself, I was just filling with anything I could lay my hands on. Drugs, alcohol, the whole thing. Yeah, it's it's um, it's you, you used it to cope with all the, the the trauma in your life, and it was the it was the thing that got you through. You know, yeah, yeah. But, and destroyed you, know, you and destroyed you at the same time. Like it, yeah, it was it, the totally did. But yeah. equally, it served a purpose, James. You know, and this is not like I'm absolutely not sat here advocating for like getting out your face to deal with any kind of trauma. But you know, there were times when I was having conversations that I probably wouldn't have had or wouldn't have been able to have if I had had a straight head on at that time. And you know, I did do a lot of processing, you know, across some of those periods of my really heavy using. And so, you know, it wasn't all bad. But at the same time, there's definitely 
better and healthier ways to have dealt with it. Yeah. It might be cheaper to go to a therapist and just kind of let it all out and then maybe yeah. not <laughs> just, just burn your whole life down around you. I mean, you know, well, there are yes. other options, you know, I know like, you know, same, same for me. I mean, I didn't, obviously I didn't choose the right option. I was more like, let's get completely fucked up and then all of this will go away. But then yeah. basically my, my entire life was just a circle of, all the bad things that happen that are happening in my life are because I'm drunk all the time and doing horrible shit. So the circle yeah. just went around and around and around. So that is yeah. it. That is we it. But of... I got used to it being that way. Like that was my safety net. It was like when things started to go well, it was like, uh, mm, I, I don't yeah. feel comfortable with this. Let me just fuck some I shit need, up. Yeah, yeah. I, I need to blow that. I need to blow this up asap yeah. like this is going to this is a bit too normal for me yeah i i said i tell people like i lived in a life that was just chaos it was absolute yeah. if it wasn't carnage i wasn't comfortable i no. i had to have it was it was very extreme it had to yeah. be very extreme and very dangerous and life-threatening shit happening all the time like <laughs> that was normal that was normal yeah. so when yeah. things were quiet i was like oof and then it would just build up and then blow up. And yeah, yeah. I'm sure you can relate to that that kind of. A hundred percent. So I doubt, isn't it? When you think about it now like that, it's just like. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy way to live your life. Like, but I mean, if you're in when you're in active addiction, I guess it's really hard to see anything outside of it. Yeah. You know, or want or want to see anything outside of it because, you know, you've surrounded yourself, you've insulated yourself with the types of people that are doing the same thing you're doing. Yeah. There's nobody, there's nobody around you that's going, hey, you are fucking up royally. You know, everybody yeah. around you is like, everybody around you is like, yeah, you're fucking awesome. Let's go. It's absolutely yeah, fun. Yeah. The and thing like, is, okay. you know, saying that, James, right, I think I always knew that I was different from the others. Like, and I knew some hardcore party animals, right? Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong. But I do feel like I was the worst one. Like, and, and at, even at that time, you know, even the people that I was like, mate, you are fucking heavy duty. I would just be like, but I'm more of an animal. Like, and I remember thinking at the time, like, that yeah. actually, I mean, it's great, but I'm kind of scared. And so I would just sniff that way as well. You know, you don't think yeah. about that. Well, I feel like the same thing. Like I surrounded myself with people that were doing the same thing I was doing, but they would get up and go to their job or they would keep functioning. And I would just kind of like <laughs> fuck off and lose a job and get into a fight and yeah. get my nose broken and do like something crazy. And they would still like successfully navigate life where as yeah. I was doing it, I was not, I was not navigating life. No. So. Yeah. Same. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how many years was your active addiction? Like, when do you classify, like, your active addiction? How long? What period is that? I want to say over 20 years. Like, I'm 42 in, like, 12 days. And okay, wow. Yeah, I know. I feel about 92 most days, trust me. Well, I'm, um, I'm, 40, I'll be, I'm 43 the 28th of November, so I, oh, oh, your I, best I feel you. <laughs> oh, how wow. About that? Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Um, Anyway, back to what we're here to talk about. Um, mm. My addiction started, I want to say, probably when I was, I don't know, I guess when I discovered ecstasy, that was it. You know, I like mm. to think that I probably could have stopped that, but, you know, realistically, you, could I? Would I? Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you know? Mm. By then, I was already drinking and, you know, smoking and whatever and just dabbling in shit, really. But I don't know. Yeah. So it is a long, old stint as a fully blown addict and do you know what I didn't even know <laughs> I had no idea even until like after I was in recovery like it took a while before I was like oh you were an addict okay cool <laughs> <laughs> good, good, right. good good to know good to know I was, like, literally like oh who knew like and the whole world was like are you fucking mad are you joking <laughs> like, <laughs> it was just like I had no idea. And I really didn't. Like, how can you not? How can you not? But you don't, do you, at the time? No, I mean, you don't look at yourself. You don't view yourself that way. That's a label that other people put on other people, isn't it? Like, addict or in addiction. Like, you don't look at yourself. You just think, like, yeah, my shit was fucked up. I was not doing well. But you don't be like, you know, that moment where you, like, like you said, like that moment of clarity where you're like, oh, 
I, there's something, um, there's something not quite right with me. Maybe uh -huh. I have a problem, you know? So, you know, it's a big deal. I always say this to people as well. And they're like, you know, how did you give up? Yeah. And I'm like, right. I've got like seven, eight steps. I always talk about things. I've, I try not to call them steps for obvious reasons, but I can't think of another mm -hmm. word. For them. So anyway, gloss over that part. But the, the, like the first thing, the very first thing is admitting it, not to somebody yeah. else, but to your damn self. To yourself. Like, yeah, if absolutely. If you can conquer that one, if you can nail that one, the rest of them are piss easy. <laughs> mm. But that first one is the freaking hardest of all. Like sitting yourself down and going, right, let's get real here. You know, yeah. this is not okay. You know, you are not okay. Like, mm -hmm. This is out of your control. That's the conversation to have yourself. It's out of your control, right? Because I've I known it wasn't okay. I'd known I wasn't okay for a long time, but I was used to that. That was my life. But mm. recognizing that it was out of my control, worse, not it was controlling me, was just right. literally like, fuck. You know, what do you do with that? But in a way, it's very empowering because then it's like, well, once you know, you can't unknow. And so, you know, hopefully that's, that's, that's the thing the that moves you into doing something about it right yeah that's the thing that like it unlocks the box doesn't it like if you just sit down and be like okay you have a problem and then be mm. like yeah I, I i can admit that i can own that yeah. that's it the, the door is now open yeah you can go through it you can go through it yeah i i'd been avoiding it for a long time because i always used to say look the only problem i've got with coke is that it keeps running out you know, and I used to joke about that. I know it was clearly like I was almost there with the truth, apart from like yeah. hiding it under a joke. Um, but yeah, that moment of truth is is hard, but it's the best because fuck, it's, you know, everything can change from there. Yeah, in an instant, you can you can kind of you know set yourself forward and be like, I can recover. I can I can do this recovery thing because up yeah. until that moment, like like you said, like I did the same thing too. I was really, I I, I knew I was bad for a while, right? Yeah. And I just kept kind of like pushing it off and brushing it off and being like, oh. well, you know, just listen to everybody. You're fine. Don't worry. You know, you just like to go a little too far when you drink. Blah 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 blah. And then I got to a moment where I looked at myself and I was like, this is. You, you're not going to have a normal life if you keep on the path you're doing. Like mm. you're doing this, you're doing this shit. You'll never have a family. You'll never have a wife. You'll never have kids. You will burn it all to the ground. If you want yeah. to change, you have, to, and I had to own that moment and be in yeah. it and accept it all, you know, in order to move forward. If I couldn't do that, I would have just kept doing it. No, exactly. Because the truth is we've been lying to ourselves all our lives, right? Up until yeah. that point, yeah. isn't it? Like telling yourself it's okay, telling yourself that tomorrow will be different, telling yourself that those are the worst ones as well, where the addiction feeds you. Like it won't be like last time. You know what to look out for. You will definitely go to bed by two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> off. Come on. And you fall yeah. for your own shit. Like oh, yeah. as if it as if it's gospel. Like, like yeah. You know, it's like the old, uh, you wake up from a really bad drinking binge and you're like, oh God, oh, you know, I'm never going to drink again. And you know, you know, by seven o'clock that night, you no. are going to be drinking again. Oh, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, yeah, but I, I mean, you know, like, like for me, I had people around me that were just being like, no, you're fine. I don't, even when I said, I thought maybe I might have a problem. People yeah. would always, and I, I'd always value other, never value anybody else's opinion above your own. Always be yeah. true to what you feel and what you think. Because uh -huh. I started to think that I did, but I had a bunch of people around me that were my friends that loved me, but they just, they couldn't tell me the truth or they didn't yeah. think I would, you know, listen. I don't know. I don't know what it was. But once I said it and said to them, I have a problem. This is what I'm going to do. I really hope you support me you know, then I could walk through that door and, and start doing my recovery. But yeah, until that moment, you know, I followed what everybody else said and was just like, yeah, no, yeah, I'll believe the lie too. You're right. I don't have a problem. It suits you, doesn't it, at that time? Like, yeah. oh, okay. Uh, if you say I'm okay, then I must be okay. Because well, it's easier be okay. to believe that. <laughs> easier yeah. to believe that than the truth. Well, yeah. And then to accept that you have a really serious issue that you need to deal with. It's easier to just be like, Nah, you're good. Exactly. Nah. Why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so you relapsed, right? I did. So you got clean. How long were you clean before you relapsed? How long was that period? So, 
a year. So I decided I was keeping him, like, literally days after I found out, which was okay. when I was around five weeks pregnant. And then mm-hmm. I was clean for the duration of pregnancy, so that was nine months, and three months after he was born. So that's a year, a whole year without drugs. But, James, let me tell you this, yeah. Before that, I had never known what I was thinking because I was just like, I might have come down. Am I hungry? Do I need a nap? Am I just mm. hungry? <laughs> you know, I never knew what I was thinking because of all of these things. And then I got clean, right, during the pregnancy, and I was still like, I don't even know if this is now what I think because now I've got hormones to contend with. So I'm no better off. Like, I still yeah. don't know what I really think. It was really bizarre. I was just like doing life, quote unquote, normal. And right. I was like, wow. Okay. Like, this is, this is actually okay. Like, and I actually really loved it for a long time. And I was like, huh. It is kind of cool because before that I couldn't get my head around and I mean I swear to God this is the truth yeah I literally could not understand or comprehend what people did all weekend if they didn't get off their tits it was literally like I do not want to go to the library I ain't watching no movies I don't want to go fucking swimming I'm not going to go to the football you know what do people actually do and I you know hand on my heart I literally couldn't wrap my head around it and yet I knew that 99.9% of the population was out there doing those very things and so it can't be that bad right but I was just like nah boring and so that was part of what kept me trapped because I just really it was all I knew it was all I wanted to know um, it was a very bizarre place to be when I was suddenly clean and I was like oh I've got all of this energy I'm like read a book I was like wow you know this is actually all right and I loved it I loved that year that I was clean it was great so then the relapse happens the relapse happens right. yes I go to my friend's house and she says you know shall we have a line and it was New Year's Eve and so it's like well duh of course we'll have a line um and I wasn't breastfeeding or anything like that at the time let me just say that right okay. um and at that time, I was right pleased with myself because it was like I had a few lines. I went to bed, and I thought, "Fucking hilly, I am that person that I never could wrap my head around before. The one that can take it or leave it. The one that doesn't like have to blow up everyone's phones at like five oh six a.m. until someone answers, right? The one that doesn't have to finish it all off before she goes to bed. The one that doesn't have to have it every like two days. Yeah, finally, I can just take it or leave it. And I was like, I'm a single mum. Yeah, I've got a lot going on. I haven't done it for a year. I deserve it, right? And what's the harm? I'm going to bed. Look at me polishing up my halo, yeah? And mm. off I go. And so for about two or three months, I was like, I was this person that I'd always wanted to be, the one that could take it or leave it. And it was just every few weeks. And it was just a little bit. But then, of course... I am an addict. Yeah, I've got to have it. It wasn't that was never going to last. That was just like I don't know what that was. That was just luring me back into a full sense of security. And then the next thing, I'm like, just you know, yeah, I, I've got nothing. You know, I've got nothing, and yeah, I'm still finding money to buy coke. And I don't even know how I done it, James. To be honest with you, I was a single mum on benefits, and you know, my business wasn't really going anywhere because I was wildly inconsistent for some strange reason. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? <laughs> it's very odd. And so so I don't know how I did it, but it's really testament to the fact that, you know, they say, well, if you really want something, you're going to find a way. Yeah. And yeah. I did. Hell did I. Why right? credit cards, I believe, probably came into play. Um, but, you know, I just really got myself into a massive, massive mess from that point. And it took me, as I say, another two years after. I didn't get clean until Chase was two. Okay. Which was a long time. <laughs> so what what did you do to get into recovery? What was that? What did you do NA? Did you do 12 step? Or did you just phew, done? I was just so over it at that point. So I didn't realize I was over it until I was over it. Like I had been on. Yeah, I know it sounds bonkers, but it's just the truth. Yeah. I'd been on the phone to my friend that morning going like something needs to change so sick of this, blah, 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 like something's got to give. I, let me be clear about this. I absolutely did not for one second mean I want to stop doing drugs, right? Why would I say that? Yeah, like it was the only thing that I really could say I loved in my life, apart from my son, yeah? And so what I really meant was I don't want to have come downs, I don't want to be broke, and I don't want my nose to be seen from outer space, yeah? Um, mm. 
And so, and I literally couldn't breathe. Like I was on the end of a 10 day mashup by this point. Yeah. But I was sleeping because obviously I have my son here, um, but it was very sporadic, my sleep. And so I just, I felt dreadful. I probably looked like I died about three years ago as well. Anyway, I went to his house and he's like, right, should we call it on then? And I was like, well, duh, obviously, you know, let's, which we did. And it got there and I was just looking at this gear thinking, I just don't even want this, right? I can't even get it up my nose anyway. And I really don't want it. But because of the person I am, like, I will not be beaten, right? So now I find myself standing over a kettle that's steaming, yeah, with the sole intention of clearing my nose so that I can do this line that I don't even want, right? And I was just like like had an outer body experience in that moment and saw myself and I was just like no this is not this is like this isn't the life that you came here for and that was it I gave up there and then um I did the line first let me say why I I was gonna I was gonna I was gonna I was gonna ask I was gonna ask did you (laughs) you know what you have to know did you just walk out and be like I'm done or you'd be like no all right now I'm done Now I'm done. Yeah, the loud. Mic drop. Uh, Mic drop. <laughs> it's more like five pound note drop. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, and that was it, right? And so four days later, I found these coaches online, yeah, and um, they were like a husband and wife team. And they were very persuasive. The guy was very persuasive, joined me to co- join, get me to co- join his coaching program. I can't even get my words out. Anyways, this company, this program was like two grand, yeah. And I was thinking, where the fuck am I getting two grand from? Are you crazy? Like I've got drug addiction. Um, but I thought <laughs> I've spent more than two grand on coke in the last yeah. like half an hour. <laughs> yeah. If I can do that, then I can surely find two grand to better my life. So worked out a payment plan with him, you know, worked out how I was gonna find this deposit and I and I went for it. Well, the first thing that we did inside of this course was finding your purpose. At this time, James, I am a life coach. Yeah, and I'm thinking to myself, people pay me to help them find their purpose. Why am I finding my purpose? I'm a life coach, <laughs> right? And so I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to do this anyway because why the hell not? Like, I just paid two grand for the damn program. And so I spent ages on this piece of work and it blah, 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 blah. You know, you write that statement, I help, da, da, with da, da, right? And so I came mm-hmm. out with this beautiful statement and it was amazing. It was very compelling. And I read it and I was like, and that's a complete fucking lie, right? Because it didn't say anything about what I felt at that time, which was, I knew, and we're only four days into my recovery at this point, yeah? So, you know, by the time I did this bit of work, like a week and four days, yeah? I knew that I was going to use my voice to help other people with their shit, basically. I knew that I felt this burning desire inside of myself to help other people get off the ride. I knew that I had been silenced for so long and stopped myself from telling anybody about the level of my despair for fear of the repercussions. Was my son going to get taken off me? Was I going to go to jail, right? You know, what was going to happen? Mm. Was my mum going to kick me out? All of the things, right? And so I kept my mouth shut. Well, my addiction loved that, right? (laughs) Because it had me right where it wanted it. Yeah. And so it had a fucking party. Of course it did. This is why my nose nearly damn fell off. Yeah. Because I believed all of the shit that was going around in my head. And so I, I realized that I, I must speak. Yeah. On the back of that realization, I had another massive realization, which was that I was not going to be able to do this work undercover. Yeah. If I was going to come out and help people, I was going to have to tell people how come I knew what I was talking about. At which point I realised that meant I was going to then have to tell my mum, right? So I was like, fuck. But once you know, you can't unknow. (laughs) And I remember I was at the laundrette living the dream, as I do. And I came straight home and I told my mum, right? I was like, you know, the last two years I have been like sniffing myself silly in my room and I've got a massive drug problem and I've been clean now for a week and a half and please don't phone the police and please don't phone social services. Um, Which to her credit, she didn't do. All right, and actually wow. everything was okay. And a couple of weeks after that, I can't remember how long, maybe four or five weeks after that, I came out and told the whole world on Facebook, right? And the mm. reason for that was because I just thought I need to do what I need to do to hold myself to a high level of accountability because I wasn't going to NA, I wasn't going to CIA. I tried a few things, didn't really align with them. You know, I'm an advocate for anything that works for anybody, like, you know, whatever works for you all good for me personally I knew that I just needed to do this for myself and so I thought right well I've got quite a big audience you know and if everybody knows what's wrong then they can help me 
which they did, right? And so I did this video. To date, 4,000 people have viewed that video, right? Which is slightly embarrassing because it's a very snotty, very sweary production, which I had never intended for it to have the reach that it has had. <laughs> um, it literally was about me holding myself accountable. But what happened on the back of that was it's just massive outpouring of, like, love and um, and just, you know, people really being like oh my god you're so courageous I can't I can't believe that you've owned that like thank you for helping me to see that it's okay for me to tell my boyfriend or my mum or whatever and then yeah. on the back of that people were like but how did you do it and I was like fuck now people think I know what I'm talking about and I don't like I just know my <laughs> own story right? yeah <laughs> so it became a bit overwhelming but I was committed then to sharing recovery um content on on socials, mainly on Facebook is my platform, right? And so, you know, I grew quite a large following quite quickly because I'm very transparent, James. You know, I'm sure you've seen some of my posts and some of the things that I share. Yeah. One of the most common things people say to me is like, fuck, I can't believe that you said that. And I'm like, but the thing is, nobody else is saying it, right? If somebody had been there saying this when I was stuck in that cycle, when I was hating myself, when I was thinking I am the only one, I can't tell anybody because no one's going to get it. Like, I'm super sick compared to the sickos, right? Yeah. Like, if there would have been just one person I could hear going, do you know I get it. I used to sniff coke on play dates, yeah? I'd have been like, praise the fucking Lord. Let me speak to this human, right? But there wasn't anyone, right? And I don't enjoy sitting there going, yeah, I used to do coke on play dates. Like, I used to turn up at nursery out my nut. That doesn't make me feel good. Let's be, let's be right, yeah? But if I don't say it, then the next person doesn't know it's okay that they're in that situation, right? And I know that there's a lot of people, James, yourself included, that will, you know, speak the truth quite openly. But the more of us that there are, the more that these messages are reaching the people that really freaking need them. And so really long answer to your question. No, I did not go to any kind of <laughs> recovery fellowship or anything yeah. like that. I did have a few um, sessions of, of hypnotherapy, just four. Um, and then okay. I basically used... Um, socials as my platform for sharing my recovery journey and that's the good the bad the ugly and everything in between you'll never catch me going like yes you know I'm shitting rainbows now it's not the truth sometimes I have bad days I will share those as well but also yeah. with a sprinkle of you know fairy dust like it's okay I did get through it here's how you know eight months in I met Nisa and Khalees um who are the founders of the recovery coach academy as you well know um, yes, big up and, to them. Yes, love them. Oh, we love them. Love them, love them, love them. And became a qualified recovery coach. You know, it took me a year. Um, I qualified in December last year. And here we are. That's amazing. Honestly, I mean, Ooh. for the, the whole spiel of it, I mean, I think, <laughs> I <laughs> honestly, I, I think like what you said, like uh, the stories, the, the, the horror stories. And I know like, you know, we want, want want people to find recovery, but I think they need to know, like, you know, like, I think, uh, I think it was Nita and one of her things says, you know, to meet people where they're at. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But I think exactly. they have to know that you've been there as well. Like you, you can, you know, meet them with your story and say, listen, yeah. I've been where you are. I know how it feels. I know yeah. that feeling. I know what it feels like. And, yeah. you know, hopefully like this platform that I'm using now with the podcast it reaches somebody that needs to hear what you're saying right now mm. so that they can take that step forward or to at least make that admission to themselves, you know, to help get them going yeah. in the right direction. Yeah. You know? And that, it's, it's important that the stories be told yeah. and that people exactly. hear them and they're real and they're raw and they're honest yeah. and they're, yeah. you know, they're not pretty, you know, they're, they're, they're shitty and they're horrible. And, you know, you, yeah. we were, you know, I was in a dark place. You've been in a dark place. We we understand that. Um, but we've now, you know, transitioned and moved out. And, you know, we're doing better stuff with our recovery. Um, mm -hmm. So you become a recovery coach, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing that. How is that going? What's that? What's that been like? What's that journey been like? Uh -huh. So I've been spinning my wheels quite a lot, is the truth, right? Because I was just like, okay, recovery is such a big deal, right? Like, mm. it's a lifestyle. It's a whole a whole thing, yeah? It's a whole yeah. another vehicle of a means of living, yeah? And I was like, okay, who am I trying to help and with what exactly? Like, am I helping the ones that are in recovery already to find meaning and purpose in their life? Am I helping the ones that are thinking about getting straight? Am I helping the ones that are corporate and holding down a job like I used to way back when? Or am I helping the single mums? Like, what am I doing? What am I actually doing? Um, yeah. And so I've thrown a lot of spaghetti at a lot of walls. And then 
you know, but most commonly the people that pop up in my inbox are mums. They're single mums just like me. They're single mums mm. that are in that place where I was just before I got clean. Yeah. And so I thought, you know what, all of this looking for the answer and, you know, soul searching, like, who do I feel called to help? It doesn't matter. The answer's in my inbox. So the people that are reaching out to me, the ones that are connecting with my message, they're the ones that I'm here to help quite clearly. Like, I, you know, I can abandon Absolutely. all of the journaling. The answer's there in my inbox. Um, there it is. And- <laughs> and so like I, I had this epiphany not that long ago only about s- maybe september time this year mm-hmm. with which i decided okay do you know what i'm gonna have a complete revamp of what i'm doing i reduced my prices by 75 percent. i changed my messaging so i was talking specifically to mums um and i decided you know what i'm gonna put this program out called transformation it was just like a mini course and so i said right i'm gonna deliver this every day throughout october i'm gonna deliver it in telegram um, I did not know what the content was going to be. I did not know exactly what it looked like on a day-to-day basis. But what I did know was that I know a thing or two about transformation. And what I did know was that the people that came and joined me would have a transformation, right? It was quite hard to articulate what this thing was without having a like, well, come and join me for October and you will have seven million pounds in the bank. You'll have repaired your damaged relationship with your husband and you'll have quit drinking. You know, I wasn't making any of these grandiose promises because I didn't know what they were going to achieve, yeah? But I did know that if they defined what the transformation was for themselves, that I would be able to give them the pieces to help them get there. And that's what we did. And so we sold it right away to like five people. And I was just like, shit, okay, amazing. Let's do this thing. Um, You know, and so I knew the rough okay, these are definitely pieces that need to be included, but I'm very intuitive. And so it was very much guided by what was coming up over the course of the month of October. And these girls, James, when I tell you, these girls have moved freaking mountains. I'm literally, I'm still blown away by them now. And we are like a month and a half after they finished. No, we're not. We're two weeks after they finished, yeah? And Hmm. I'm like, shit, man. And so they've joined me inside of my next thing that I've I've offered them afterwards. So I decided to run Transformation again through November. We've got another four girls on there this month. You know, they're taking things at a different pace. But I know, like, the next thing for me is to bring this back in January um, because that's the time when people just really want to change everything, don't we? (laughs) Right. That New Year's, that New Year's resolution, baby. That New Year to get. And so I've been offering this thing real, real, real low cost. When I bring it out in January, it's going to be like thirty-seven pounds. You know, this is Mm. like it's a no-brainer. Thirty-seven pounds to change your life forever. Like, hello, why wouldn't you do it? You know what I mean? But Mm. you know, I just think for me, it's really about being able to connect with. Okay, I see where you're at. I see where you're at, and I see where you want to go, and I see what you think you need. And I'm going to give you what you really need, um, you know, okay. and, and we'll go from there. And I, you know, I love to be able to be able to just kind of read between the lines and go, OK, you know, I, I see myself in you um, and, and, you know, be able to offer them different ways of thinking about things. So it's never about giving them the answers, as you well know. Yeah, it's not like, OK, yeah. you do this ABC thing. And you're going to change your life. It's never about that because each person's life is different. Your your recovery will have looked way different from what mine does. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. And I wanted to be clear with everyone as well. You know, transformation was never about abstinence. Yeah, like that's not a prerequisite of the course. Like some people just want to oh, explore good. what life might look like if they start to make different choices. You know, like I didn't absolutely. know. I don't know about you. I did not know where to start when I wanted to or even thought about maybe one day I might quit drugs. I was like, well, how do I even do that? What does that look like? What does it mean? Who do I be? How do I be? Yeah, I had no (laughs) idea what I was doing. I I got clean and I was like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with myself? Like, What is my life going to look like? Exactly. And there's so much stuff that's unknown. So like, I just really wanted to, you know, create something that was going to be able to take them on a journey where they could just play with stuff in a safe space and see, okay, do you know what? This feels good. Okay. That doesn't feel so good. This over here feels really uncomfortable. Is that because it's pushing my edge or is it because it's not right for me? You know, and just be able to facilitate that. So I'm really good at people and, and, and at community stuff. And so, yeah. you know, we built this safe space where everyone was able to just show up and share things they hadn't told people before ever in their lives inside mm-hmm. of a space where they didn't even know the other girls, you know. And I was just like, wow, this is incredible. Um, so that's my coaching. I also do one-to-one, um, which, again, is awesome. You know, one-to-one's where the magic happens, isn't it? Because it's your yeah. own 
your own personal journey but I mm. really um have been on a spiritual journey as well which I only just recently realized actually is one and the same as my recovery journey I thought they were two separate entities for a long time <laughs> turns out they're not <laughs> oh wow um, yeah and so you know I do a lot of um there's a lot of spiritual practices that come into my coaching if a person's open to it um okay. and you know it basically underpins everything that I do James like spirituality really anchors me in recovery and my various different you know rituals and practices and habits like without them I feel like I'm lost what tends to happen is you know things start to go really really well and mm. then and I ditch all the things that got me there like you know my journaling or like my 15 minutes of meditation whatever I'm just like right things are working I don't need to do any of that anymore and then after not very long all goes a bit tits up again and I'm like right yeah. bring back the thought function <laughs> and it's like why do we do that to ourselves as soon as things start going well we ditch the very things that got us there yeah but that's the that's the that's you know that's everybody it's like um you know like people with like manic depressive or like schizophrenia mm -hmm. they take medication to keep them normal and then they're like oh I feel fine so they stop taking all the medication yeah. and then yeah. they go fucking nuts that's you know and I think it, it's the yeah. same with us it's like you know what the what are the tools that you use to keep you functioning in your recovery? And I just did a whole um, podcast about what I called it finding balance okay. and balance in my balance in my life uh -huh. has some things that have to be involved. I have to be able to be active. I have to run or go to the gym. Mm -hmm. It helps me with anxiety and depression. I need certain things to be in my life so that I can maintain my focus and moving forward you know like this podcast now is part oh. of my balance it goes into it it helps me mm. you know work my work my recovery you know yeah. i never went i never went to 12 step i just i just quit um yeah. so i've never done any of the fellowship stuff but no. you know like like you said i support it i'm you know it, whatever yeah. gets people clean and sober i 100 percent support but there are things in my life that I need to do. And like you were saying, like journaling and meditation. And mm -hmm. there are things that just kind of like pin you in and hold you there. Yeah. And they keep yeah. you steady. Because if not, you yeah. kind of go, oh. Yeah. yeah. And I know when the wobbles happen, like mm -hmm. I've learned to really listen to myself and to, to be able to be honest with myself about what's really going on so you know right. there are times when the voice is just so loud it's like fuck it just get on it you know and the worst ones are, are when it just creeps in when there's no rhyme or reason on the face of it mm. like i'll just be sitting here and i've had a really good day you know or chase will just be gone to bed and i'll be like oh that was a great day why don't we get on it and i'm like no one's pissed me off you know there's not any trigger I, and and it's like what? But once that voice is there, James. Once I notice it, it just goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it's very persistent, and it's very persuasive. It's very seductive, you know. It's very convincing. And the worst mm. thing is like knowing that I'm not going to do it, but also having to endure this voice in the other ear. And so you've got this voice going on and on and on, knowing. And, and yourself on the other side, knowing that you're not really ever going to do it. And so, like, learning to recognize that my addiction is not me. Yeah, it's a separate entity with its own voice that sounds like me. Um, and it's a lying fuck. You know, that is a moment of freedom. Yeah. And so I, I think the days when it does come and try and bite me on the ass is about just being able to own that yeah so i've done facebook lives before now where i've said you know what i really want to get on it i really want to get on it i'm really struggling i'll be like crying my eyes out or something on this live you know i'm yeah. not to being really really real but i know that i'm not going to do it and it's like as soon as i've said it it loses its power yeah yeah as well it's, in head, it's like this creepy stalker that's like i'm gonna get you right yeah but once it's out there it's like oh so bad you know and i'll get off the live and i'll be like yes all right now you know and it, it, uh, it, it is it's about just being able to share that right because it it has a magic 100 percent, it has a magic having someone to talk to having someone to understand having someone to listen you know whatever um yeah. because while it's just Absolutely. there it's only going to go one way yeah yeah the voice in your head is is a dangerous thing because it, it can it knows how to get you and knows how to get you but thinking you hear your own head in your own voice mm. like, oh yeah i would question it <laughs> yeah 
That's my conscience is telling me to get fucked up. I need well, to listen. <laughs> <laughs> my conscience is a horrible, horrible person. Go away. <laughs> Leave me alone. Well, that's your addict. Your addiction is the one that's in there and it's going, hey. Exactly. Yeah. It it's, it's, it's a, it's a dangerous you. thing, man. Yeah, it's a dangerous thing. And then that's what they say, like, you know, like, no matter how far I get into my recovery, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm working all the time yeah. to stay in recovery, you know, because it's, yeah. it's easy, you know, like yeah. people say like, oh, you know, it, it just, it's one drink. It's one drink. I know it's one drink. I'll always know it's one drink. Yeah. And people always, I've had people ask me before they're like, you know, when I tell them I'm sober and they're like, yeah, but you don't, you just want to have like one. I'm like, no. That will unleash something that yeah. will be very bad for everybody. And they're like, well, you just don't think you could manage it. I was like, no. Dude, Are you fucking crazy? One, I spent, that one spent 11 years not one, managing it. Yeah. That one drink is the only one you're in control of, right? The only yeah. one. Because yeah. anything after that, it is gone. And so that means the yeah. control lies in that first one. Well, it's gone. If I, if I drink one time, I know horrible shit will happen. Mm. I know that because I've been there and I did the horrible shit. And I know yeah. that I can't manage it. I've recognized that. I accept it. I know mm. that I can't do it. I'm not that person. And when people um, say like, well, yeah, but it's just one. Yeah, but it's not just one for me. It'll never be just one. It can yeah. be just one for you. And that's fine. That's who you are. You can do that. I'm not that person. And I know no. that. And it took me 11 years to realize that I'm not that person. Mm. But yeah. I, I know that now. I know that now. And I've accepted that. Yeah, you know, so I just tell people, I no, not not me, not ever again. No yeah. way. It's no so way. empowering, though, isn't it, to be able to just go? Do you know what? No, like no. Well, just to know, like, just to know who I am, and just like accept the fact that that's how it is. That's how it is. Yeah. Like, there's yeah. nothing I can do to change that. And you know what? I, people kind of can't wrap their head around that sometimes because they don't know what that's like because they can have three and go home and have a great life and function. Mm. I can't have three. I can't have no. one because it leads to 15. Like I can't do yeah. it. I will yeah. fuck up everything. Uh -huh. I know it. I absolutely know it. Yeah. So knowing I it has given, <laughs> knowing it has given me the strength to just be like, I know now and I'll yeah. never do it again. Yeah. So, yeah. It is, so it is, it is like a, it's a huge strength to know like I, I tell people like when you, you know when people ask like you know accepting that moment and people are like you know it's like showing you know isn't it like showing weakness no that is a huge strength to admit a fault in yourself yeah as big as, as like addiction is you know like if you yeah. say i have a problem and i admit that i have a problem and i own that i have a problem huge huge strength you've mm -hmm. just done something that you've probably put off for you know, however many years it is, you've, you've told it to quiet down and now you've accepted it. Now you've said it out loud, hugely yeah. empowering. Yeah. Hugely. Very impactful. Agreed. Um, so I think we'll wind it down here. We're coming up to almost an hour. Um, this mm -hmm. has been a great, great, great conversation. Sarah, this has been amazing. You have a, an amazing story. Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell the listeners uh, about what you're doing? Like any of your programs coming up, any of the coaching you're doing, um, you know, any uh, social media things that you have going on? Let everybody know what you're up to and what's going on. What's what's happening? Sure. OK, so I am. You'll find me on all of the social media platforms, basically, um, which I know you've got the links, James. So I will yes. just let listeners yeah. find their own way there. I will um, share them all. <laughs> amazing thank you my darling um and so transformation as i said is coming up in january again you know this is aimed at mums specifically single mums but you know mums of any description are welcome to join us um and it is recovery based of course it is but this will help you to create those foundational pieces that are the springboard for lasting change yeah and it starts with a decision it starts with a decision and i keep saying to people you know Imagine who you could be if you started to make different choices, you know? Like, I hated mm -hmm. myself for so long. You don't need to carry on. You can make your kids proud. You can make yourself proud. You can have money for their birthday. You can take them out and enjoy yourself without going to the pub or wondering when you're next going get, to get a drink, you know? And I can show you how, right? Um, so that will be going live in January. I will be enrolling as of now. It's going to be £37, as I said. 
Um, aside from that, I do offer one to one coaching. Um, again, I coach mainly women. That said, I do have male clients at this exact moment in time. You know, if my story resonates with you, if my vibe resonates with you, I'm absolutely open to a conversation. Um, and that again is intuitively guided. You know, I'm not one of these people that's like, you must book 10 sessions with me or we're not doing it. Um, <laughs> we can do it, you know, one off. We can just do one and see how you like it, whatever it is for you. Um, I will be looking to create some more courses and so on over at the new year. Um, and I'm hoping, James, to bring back yeah. my podcast. To bring there back my podcast. Yes. Which you will be a guest on. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I need a new name for it. Um, and so I've got, you know, a bunch of ideas and just not got around to it this year. But I feel like 2024 is the year of the podcast. That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. If you ever, if you need any help brainstorming or, or bouncing ideas, I'm happy to help you um, start the journey. I've just, uh, this is my, I've just completed my first year of podcasting. So I've learned a lot. I'm still learning. Um, so yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. So um, we'll continue to do it. I'm continuing to, um, you know, push for people in recovery, people sharing their stories, uh, mm -hmm. sharing my own stories. And uh, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thank you for doing this. I'm glad we finally nailed it down. It's been <laughs> months in the making since we met on one of the Recovery Coach Academy things. <laughs> yeah. um, and we've been, we've just been chatting back and forth, like, you know, when can we do this? When can we get it done? I'm so pleased that we've gotten it done. Um, so I will add all your links to the bio on the YouTube. and. Um, yeah, just if you are interested, get a hold of Sarah and, you know, start the transformation, you know, see where you could be in a month by making better decisions. I mean, I think we all could be in a better place by making better decisions, right? Hell yeah. It, you know what? I was actually doing the work myself alongside the girls that I was like, you know, just chose something that I thought I wanted to change. And I was like, shit, this is actually really good. Like, you know, just get you thinking in different ways. Like it's so easy to give out the advice, right? But we don't take it yeah. yourself, do you? Um, yeah. So it's like, right, okay, let me try this. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for having me, James. I really appreciate it. Always happy to share, you know, recovery, hope and inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's the message, man. We're sharing recovery, hope, and inspiration. We're helping people. We're going to meet them where they're at, and we're going to try to get mm. them on the path to recovery because you can change your life. You can live the mm -hmm. life that you never thought you had that because of drugs and alcohol. Mm. I mean, we there's proof right here, myself, Sarah, and millions yeah. of more people out there doing it. So, all right. Thank you, Sarah. And thank listen, you. this is this is so great. Bye. Bye-bye.